welcome everybody to today's uh, joint statistics and uh, computer science colloquium. So our speaker today is Adel Javanmar, who is visiting us from Stanford. He is currently wrapping up his uh, PhD in electrical engineering. His advisor is Andrea Montanari, who's a, I think a familiar name to, that's a familiar name to many of us. Uh, before uh, doing graduate work at Stanford, he was at Sharif University in Tehran, doing a, a two degrees in electrical engineering and in math. And um, so despite getting a degree in EE, he really is doing work in machine learning and statistics, I would say. Uh, He's worked on many different things for somebody at his stage uh, of uh, career. He's done work on compressed sensing with David Donahoe and Andrea Montanari. He's done um, work on graphical model selection in, a, in settings with latent variables. Uh, that grew out of an internship that he did at Microsoft Research in New England, and that's with the group around Cham Kakade that I think many of us know. And, but maybe the main problem he's been working on in, in doing his time as a graduate student is uh, uh, one in a very hot area, I would say, and that is uh, uncertainty assessment in the analysis of high dimensional data. And this is something that he'll tell us about today. So welcome, Adele, and we're excited thanks to hear you Thanks a lot for your introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here at University of Washington. So today my talk is on high dimensional data analysis and towards the end of the talk, I will also try to go quickly over a couple of other projects I've been doing in my PhD. Okay, let's start. It's about high dimensional data analysis. So what's a high dimensional data set? As we all know, these days we have data available everywhere. We are collecting more and more data, both more and more samples, but also interestingly, we are collecting richer and richer types of data. As technology evolves, we are able to measure very fine-grained and interesting phenomena. And the data set that we should deal with are very feature-rich. So the data set contains many samples. And for each sample, we are measuring a large number of variables, a large number of features. And in most of the cases, the number of features that we have measured is much, much bigger than the number of samples that we have in our data set. And this is essentially the definition of high-dimensional setting because we think of these features or variables as the dimensions of the problem. And this is, in fact, a trend in modern data analysis. The voracious systematic collection of very detailed information is actually driving us towards this regime. And we see this trend in, in many applications. So let me focus on one specific important example of high dimensional data. And the example is about electronic health records, or in short, EHR. Recently, there has been a drive in systematic collection of health records in digital format. It's very efficient in terms of storage, information retrieval, and also digital record can be easily shared among different healthcare settings. Now, EHR contains a range of information from transcript record, allergies, diagnosis information, medications, the medical history, the lab results, and also biomedical images like MRI, fMRI, X-ray, so for each patient, we have a very detailed and fine-grained information. And if you want to analyze such data set, the first step is to construct some feature, some numerical variable. And you can think of that if you want to do this with this sort of detailed information, you'll come up with a large number of features. So this is clearly a high-dimensional data set. Another question is, what can we do with such feature-rich data set? Well, to put it broadly, the goal is to extract some useful, actionable information. We want to infer something, some statistical pattern from our data. And there is ongoing interest to construct predictive models for different tasks, for predicting readmission rate, the patient evolution, clinical outcomes. And once you have these models, you want to use them to take actions, to design the policy, to advise some treatment. And this sort of meaningful use of data, the EHR data, has been supported in recent years by US Congress through High Tech Act. And nowadays, there are various incentives for hospitals and clinicians to use EHR in a secure and private manner and improve the performance of care delivery. 
We also hear about many interesting challenges going on, which involves EHR. Probably the most famous one was the Heritage Health Prize. And the goal in this competition was to use the medical record of the people and identify the people who will be admitted in hospital in next year. And it's a very important problem because the studies show more than 71 million persons in the US are admitted to hospital each year. And in 2006, over $30 billion was spent over unnecessary readmission. So that would be very important if you can use this sort of machine learning and statistical tool to identify these people who are most at risk to be admitted to hospital and make sure that they get the right treatment and avoid these unnecessary, uh, unnecessary readmissions. So this is one specific example of high dimensional data. And a good portion of my work, as Matthias said, in PhD was focused on this setting. So these are a list of problems that I've been working on. So today I'm gonna to talk about the first one, the uncertainty assessment. But the other problems are also characteristically high dimensional. Of course, they have different natures and different challenges. So let's start with the uncertainty assessment. So I will start by an example, a very concrete one, which is also related to EHR. So there's a company called Practice Fusion. It's a company in Bay Area. It's a free web-based company which works with EHR and runs this sort of data analysis competition on Kaggle website. So I'm using the data from Kaggle. It's the real data. And from this data set, I'm taking 500 patients. I have the medical records of this patient. And I construct around 800 variables, features, based on the information that they have. So this is a very small example. You have only a few hundred patients. And I'm doing that intentionally because people are usually concerned that how this sort of asymptotic analysis that you have will apply to the real problem. So I want to say, if you have already a few hundred people, then, then you are in a good shape. Okay? But of course, you can come up with much more features. And as you see, the number of features here is bigger than the number of patients. So it's a high dimensional problem. And in this data set, what you have is that you know whether the people have diabetes or not. So it's a labeled data set. Okay. And what's the goal? The goal is to find the significant variables in predicting type 2 diabetes. So what do I mean by significant? Suppose that you have a data analyst and you give this data set to her. She runs some sort of inference algorithm and she comes back with the following observation that based on my analysis, people with higher bilirubin value are more susceptible to diabetes. So bilirubin is some component of the blood. It's a, it's a common test. And no matter how smart she is, this is a claim based on the data. It's subject to all these sorts of noise and variability. It depends on the specific sample of population that you have. And now the question is how certain we are about such claim. And this is essentially what I want to talk about today. So before getting into details, let me say what I want to do. So I will fit a model for, for this data set. It's a regularized model. And you see that I have different parameters for this model. For each feature, I have a parameter, and the parameter is showing the contribution of that feature. So you have around 800 features. Most of the parameters are zero, which are saying that most of the features are irrelevant to type 2 diabetes, but some of them are non-zero. You see like blood pressure, bilirubin, year of birth is negative correlation, which means if you are younger, you are less susceptible. So this is the model estimate that you get, and now, I change the sample of people that they have, and I fit the model. So that would be the new estimate. Then I change another, uh, then I change the, su the, the subset of the patient, I take another 500 people, and that would be the parameter estimation. So you see that these parameter estimations are changing based on what are the patients on your study. And there are two questions here. The first one is, how stable these estimations are? And the second question is, these are just some point estimate. What can we say about the true underlying parameters? Okay, so these are the two important questions. And by the end of the talk, I will propose a method to take one specific subset. So let's say you have one subset of people, 500. I will propose a method to make these confidence intervals for the true parameters based on your estimation. So these are the 95% confidence interval. And then once you have this sort of 
inner walls, you can judge about this claim that there are some relation between bilirubin and type 2. You can judge whether these are some statistical pattern or they just occur because of randomness or not. Okay? So this is essentially the, the, to the, the topic of my talk and what I want to do. Okay? So why is it a hard problem at all? Why can't you use just some off-the-shelf classical statistics to compute this confidence interval? The short answer is high dimensionality. So if you were in the case that the number of features was fixed and n was going to infinity, you could use large sample theory, all this sort of CLT and concentration measure and co compute this sort of confidence interval. But the situation in high dimensional problems is completely different because the number of variables is also growing with the number of samples, even at a much faster rate. And you cannot use these sort of methods. Uh, it's fair to say that much progress has been achieved over the past decades for high dimensional statistics in terms of parameter estimation, feature variable selection, and prediction by work of many great researchers in the last decade. But the question that I'm trying to address here is somehow more ambitious. Instead of having just point estimate, I want to see how we can assign a measure of uncertainty to this estimation something like confidence interval or p-values in statistics. And we are among the first groups who have been started working on this problem, and now many groups are working on that. I, I will address some of the work in the related section and, and the differences. So I start with the EHR, but this sort of high dimensional and uncertain assessment applies to many problems, like targeted online advertising, personalized medicine, social networks, in collaborative filtering and recommendation systems, in genomics, and there are lots of lots of applications for, for this problem. In the second uh, section, I will go over the regularized estimators, which are widely applicable for high dimensional statistics. So as I said, in this regime, you have more parameters than observation. So if you want to fit a model, you are probably wondering that there are various impossibilities because you have more degree of freedom than what you are observing, okay? And it's kind of true, and what people try to do is to investigate some sort of low dimensional structure in your parameters, some sort of side information or redundancy. And they fit the model by trying to minimize the cost function. So your cost function has two terms. The first term is loss, somehow measures the fidelity to your observation, and the second term is promoting the sort of structure that you are seeking for. So you are looking for some uh, not too complex model which can explain your data. And this regularization mitigates some of the curses of high dimensionality like the spurious correlation, noise accumulation, and also instability to noise and the sampling. But it also comes at the price. The first thing is that the model that you get from this optimization is biased because of the regularization parameter. You are biased towards the small complexity. And this bias, as we will see, is a very main challenge in, in, is the main challenge in uh, uncertainty assessment problem that we want to address. And the second issue is that this is a nonlinear and non-explicit. It's given by the solution of some convex optimization in most of the cases. And it's very hard to characterize the distribution of such model, so the parameter the, that you get for the model. So let's get back to the example. So here the response variable is y, is a, is a vector in n dimension. Each coordinate is 0, 1, saying the patient has diabetes or not. And xi is the feature vector of the patient i. So it's in p dimension. And here we consider a logistic model. So this is the underlying model that we are assuming. And theta 0 here somehow shows the contributions of different features in predicting type 2 diabetes. Now, if you want to find the, mod, find the parameter vector theta zero or fit the model, the regularized estimator becomes the following. So you have this logistic loss, which corresponds to the loss for, for this uh, logistic uh, regression. And then we are penalizing with the L1 norm. So it's just the sum of the absolute value of the parameter. So this is the convex optimization. It's very good. And it's very well known that it does variable selection. Most of the entries here, most of the coordinates of theta are zero. And this is because of the geometry of L1 ball. 
uh, we will get to, to that later. So if you apply this sort of uh, regular estimator, this is what you get. So you see that most of the entries here are zero. Most of the parameters are zero, as we expected. And you had around 800 features, but 62 of them are non-zero. Okay. Another question is, how can we construct the confidence interval for the true parameter for the theta zero, for each single parameter? So let me formally define what's a confidence interval. So you have this theta y1, x1, to yn, xn. You have n samples. yi is the response variable, and xi is the feature. And you have some underlying model. So given the feature xi, your response is generated according to this probabilistic model. Now the confidence interval for each coordinate, for each parameter theta 0 j, I want to find a confidence, I want to find an interval ij, which contains the true parameter with some level of confidence. So for instance, alpha is 5%, so you want 95% confidence interval. And it's good to know that the confidence intervals are random objects because they depend on data. Okay? So why is it useful? Why do we care about uncertainty assessment? So I will give three different reasons, but there are many, many more. The first one is scientific discovery. So you have this massive amount of data. You run this algorithm. And then you see that bilirubin is related to type 2 diabetes with 95% level of confidence. Then you can publish a paper on that or at least try to investigate it further using your domain expertise. But if it's not that certain about this correlation, you cannot make any formal claim on that. So it's very good. It's, it can be thought as the first step for scientific discovery. The second reason is for decision making. So uncertainty assessment is very important here. So let's say that you have a system, and the state of the system is encoded by a large parameter vector, theta 0. And you don't know what's the state of the system, but you are monitoring your system and taking measurements v1 to dn. And let's say they are coming from some probability distribution that depends on the underlying state, theta 0. Now, once you have these measurements, you want to estimate the state of the system. And based on this estimate, you want to take an action. So this is the state space. There is a bad region. If, if theta 0 is in the bad region, your system is malfunctioning, and you want to stop it. If it's in the good region, you are in good shape. Okay. So you want to take action based on your estimation. So let's say you have this observation, and these are your point estimates. It could be here or here. Now, if you want to take action, these point estimations are not sufficient. Because, for instance, in this case, you probably would say, in the right case, I'm in a safer situation because I'm further from the boundary. But if you compute the confidence region based on this estimation for the true state, you might get something like this one. Now, in the left case, you are in a safer place. So if you want to take action, you really want to know what's the uncertainty assessment. So this was the second reason. And the third reason is somehow more technical. It's for optimization and stopping group. So I talked about this regularized, regular, regularized estimators. And these are convex optimization. So if you want to solve this optimization over a larger scale problem, you have this computational issue. And what people do is that they try to use some sort of first order method. So this method converges slowly compared to the classical Newton method. But the good point is that the computational cost per iteration is pretty cheap. So you have some first order method, and you should run it for many iterations. And now the question is, where should we stop? Okay. So what people usually do in practice is that they try to come up with some sort of convergence rate, saying that, OK, these are my estimation across iteration, and I want to be in epsilon neighborhood of global mean of my estimator theta hat. And then you should, if you want to be in epsilon neighborhood, you should run this algorithm for this number of iterations, or at least for this order of number of iterations. But the point that I want to raise here is that the goal is statistical inference. What we really care about is, is the true parameter theta zero, not theta hat. Okay? And optimization here is just a goal. It's just a tool. It's not the goal. So if you want to set some stopping rule 
it's more holistic to say how close I am to, from the, the true parameter theta zero and set the stopping rule based on that. And confidence intervals can become very handy here because at each iteration, you can compute this sort of confidence interval. And then you can say, for instance, I will stop whenever the variations in my estimate are negligible to the, comparing to the length of the confidence interval. So I will stop here. And this is important because what you really care is theta zero, not theta hat. Okay, so these were three main reasons, but you can think of more reasons for uncertainty assessment. So in the next section, I will explain two methods, two approaches, and then explain the shortcomings, and then I will propose my approach. So let's focus on a linear case. So your response variable depends on the feature vector in a linear way. And this linear case is rich enough that they can explain the main idea. But uh, I will explain at the end of the talk how can you generalize it for nonlinear model. So you have a uh, response variable y is x theta 0 plus w. And w is Gaussian noise with mean 0 and covariance sigma squared time by density. OK? So in this case, the regularized estimator comes uh, boils down to something which is called lasso. It's very well known. And here you are penalizing with the L1 norm. And let me stress that theta zero, the true parameter is some, something deterministic that you don't know. But theta hat depends on your data. So it's a random object. And if you want to address this uncertainty assessment, one idea is to try to find the distribution of theta hat. But it turns out to be very challenging because it's just uh, given the solution of some optimization problem. And for a general design matrix X, this is technically impossible to characterize the distribution of theta hat in high dimensional region. So one possible approach that you are probably thinking about is to do some sort of bootstrap and sensitivity analysis. So the idea is that you have the feature vector data at each instant, you make a fake example of that by sampling the rows with replacement, and then you fit the last estimator, you get some point in the feature space. Then you take another fake instance, you get another estimation, and you do it for many iterations. And after some point, you have a cloud of, after some iteration, you have a cloud of points in your feature space. And probably it's giving something about the variance, the, the variations of your estimation, but what can we say about the true parameter theta zero? The point is that all of these estimations in high dimension are biased. So your true parameter is some, somewhere here. And having this cloud of points, actually you cannot say anything about the confidence. You cannot construct the confidence region for theta zero because you don't know the bias. So it fails because of the bias in high dimension. The second approach is a very simple idea. It's called sample stability. So as I was uh, explaining, the main issue here is the high dimensionality. So let's go to the low dimensional case. So this is your data set. You cut it in two halves. In the first half, you run the lasso estimator, and it gives you a subset S that hopefully contains all the relevant variables plus some other thing. And then you restrict the second half to the set S, and now you are in a low dimensional case because the number of Samples hopefully is bigger than the number of set S that you, you have recovered in the first step. And once you are in a low dimensional case, you can solve the list square and it, uh, get some explicit formula for distribution of theta and do the uncertainty assessment based on it. So what are the problems with this approach? Any idea? One assumption here is that this, this, the, the subset S should contain all the relevant variables plus some other thing that you can rip off in the second step. So you want to make sure that S contains all, all the relevant variables, and this is a strong assumption. The second uh, problem is that, of course, you need to throw away half of data, and in many cases it could be problematic to fit the lesser estimator. But the main problem is that it actually depends on the splitting. So if you split the data in two halves in another way, you'll come up with another estimate. 
for, for your theta hat and another confidence interval. So it depends on how you are splitting the data. Okay, and to overcome these uh, limitations, I will, I, I will propose the following approach. So it's based on debiasing the lasso schemator. So as I said, lasso is a uh, regularized co uh, cost function. You are minimizing the sort of log likelihood and also the L1 norm. So your lasso estimator is somewhere here at the intersection of these two volumes. And you see that theta is at the, is at the corner of the L1 ball. So most of its coordinates are zero, as we saw. Now theta is biased towards small L1 penalty. So if you want to compensate for that, you should move in a direction that increases the L1 norm. And that's the subgradient. So if you compute the subgradient, uh, by, by KKT condition, this is the formula that you get. So what you do is that you take your estimator and move in this direction. So this is just the, the idea, the general idea, that how you want to remove the bias of the less estimator. Okay, so this is the modified estimator that I'm defining. And U here means unbiased. Of course, I've not shown it, it's unbiased yet. But, uh, yes? Why use lasso or a complexity penalty in the first place? If it's going to do all this damage, then you're going to have to undo. Okay, so the question is why are you using the lasso estimator in the first place? Because later we are saying that it's the source of the problem. But the point is that you have this sort of high dimensional problem, that the number of parameters is bigger than the sample. And you need to somehow take into account the structure that you know about your data. So if you just remove the regularization part, there are too many solutions for your problem. So you can do that in the detection process. Are you? You can do that in the same process that you're now using to decide you know, which parameters are significantly different mm -hmm. from zero. But so in the first step, you get too many models. So which one do you choose? No, let's say all of them come up with non-zero. Anyway, right? we should okay. talk about this then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here, M is a matrix that I've not explained what is M. Right. So the, yeah. the focus on lasso, I assume, is because you do think about sparsity, in which case the lasso would be a, providing a better estimate than, say, rich regression. Yeah, right? so here I'm saying, yeah, the focus is on sparsity for, uh, I mean, up to now. But I will explain how you can generalize this method for general regularization. In yeah, to so here I'm to focusing, Pedro's point. Yeah. Um, to use some regularization technique right. that may not enforce zeros. So you're thinking about a scenario where this last right. is a particularly right. good right. way of estimating the so I'm, yes, that's parameter true. vector. So here the focus is on sparsity and that's why I'm talking about the last estimator. So I will explain what is the matrix M here. So this is something that you can choose yourself. So the question is how should we choose the matrix M? And to address this question, uh, you, you should write two-line calculation, and you get the following, that the unbiased estimator, or the modified estimator, is given by the true parameter theta zero, plus a bias term, and the variance term. Okay, that both of them depend on the matrix M. And sigma hat here is the, just the, the empirical covariance. Okay, now how should we choose the matrix M? Well, what we need is a small bias, and also small variance, because the variance of the error term is actually controlling the length of the confidence interval, okay? Now let's say that you are in low dimensional case, so n is much bigger than p. Then what can you do? Well, in this case, sigma hat is full rank because it's a p by p matrix of rank n and n is bigger than p. So you can take m to be inverse of sigma hat. Then you won't have any bias here. And what you get, you can check it's really just the least square. But in high dimensional case, sigma hat is not invertible. So you cannot take that approach. And you cannot really make the bias exactly zero. So what we do is that we upper bound the bias and the variance over the ith coordinate. And mi here is the ith row of the matrix m. Okay, so I bound them in the following way. And now the idea is that we minimize the variance over the ith coordinate and meantime, uh, we, we put some, uh, meanwhile, we, we put some constraint on the bias, on the ith coordinate, okay? So if you plug in for the variance and the bias, this would be your optimization problem. 
So you have a quadratic cost function, and you have this constraint. Okay? So you are trying to minimize the variance. At the same time, you have a constraint over the bias. And now the question is, how should we choose the C parameter? So I will explain it later. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so sigma hat here <laughs> is uh, p by p. <laughs> and you have many fewer observations than p. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about estimating from the same samples and from the same small number of samples? Yes. yes. So here sigma hat is p by p, but it's rank n. And n is much smaller than p. So it's rank deficient. So this is the high dimensional. Yeah. So we are focusing on that one. So let, let's see how it works on, on the data, the diabetes. So this is the modified estimator. So the red points are, are nothing special. These are just the feature I was showing before. So all of them are just the coordinates of the unbiased estimator. So the first observation is that your modified estimator is not sparse anymore, because you took the lasso and you moved in the direction of subgrade. But as we will see, for, for the goal of uncertainty assessment, this is a very good object, because we can characterize the distribution of, of the unbiased estimator. OK? So if we neglect the bias here, you have only one Gaussian error term. And so the distribution of the unbiased estimator is normal with the right mean, and it's some covariance that you can actually characterize. So you have the joint distribution for your modified estimator. Okay? And once you have this distribution, you can construct all this confidence interval. So let's see how it works on the data. So here I'm taking the modified estimator, subtracting the true parameter and normalizing with the variance. And based on the theory, it should be normal zero one. And in the left panel, you are seeing the histogram. And right panel, it's just the sample quanta. And it's all only with 500 samples. So if you increase n, you get much better uh, approximation. Another question here is that, OK, I'm saying you take unbiased estimator, the modified estimator, and subtracting the true mean. So what's the true vector of theta zero? It's just some real data. Right? We don't know what's theta zero. Okay. So the point is that the data set has much higher number of perish patients. It has 10,000 records, not just 500. So I'm taking the ground truth based on the whole, based on the whole data set. So I'm taking all the patients, but just 800 features. So you are in low dimensional regime now. And then fit the model, get theta zero, and then treat it as the ground truth. So this is how I, I've computed theta zero. OK, is it clear? And now these are the confidence interval, 95% confidence. And you can check, because you have the theta zero, you can check what's the coverage. And the coverage is 93.6. Okay. So the next section is about the theoretical result. So the bulk of the theory is, is the following. It, it relates to the following optimization problem, okay, because this is what we are doing to, to find the metrics M. So there are a couple of important questions to be addressed here. How should we choose the parametric C? Is this problem feasible or not? And then what's the resulting variance that we get for each coordinate, because these variants are controlling the length of confidence interval, and we want them to be as small as possible. OK? So in order to address this question, I make the following assumption, that the rows of the x are IID. So different patients are treated as IID sample. And they are coming from some sub-Gaussian distribution with covariance sigma. So sub-Gaussian includes a much larger family of distribution than just the Gaussian. So all the bonded distribution, for instance, are sub -gauche. OK? So they are coming from some distribution with covariance sigma. We don't know what is the covariance sigma. And then we can show that if you choose C bigger than square root of log P over N, the problem is feasible. And the variance of the i error is bounded by, by the following expression. So the first observation is that as you increase the number of samples, the length of the inner walls, which are controlled by this variance, are shrinking, which is somehow intuitive. The second observation is that it doesn't depend on P, the number of features. 
And it's very good because we are in high dimensional, P is very, very big. And this is saying that the number of features, the large number of features is not adversely affecting the length of the confidence interval. Okay, so here is the main theorem. Maybe we'll spend a few minutes to parse it. So we are saying that X has IID Gaussian rho with some covariance sigma. Now, in a symptotic case, N, the number of samples, and P, the number of features, are going to infinity. But we assume that the eigenvalues of covariance sigma are bounded. So the minimum is bounded away from zero, and the maximum is also bounded by some constant. And then you have the following distribution for theta hat u, the modified estimator. So it's essentially saying that it's uh, unbiased, and it's distributed according to some normal distribution. And you can characterize the joint distribution exactly. You have the covariance of all the coordinates. And here, I have one other assumption that n should asymptotically dominate s squared log p squared. So n was the number of samples, p was the number of features, so what's s? s is the number of non-zero entry in the true parameter theta zero. So in this case, it's the number of truly significant variable in predicting diabetes. Okay, so the number of samples should be bigger than s squared log p squared. Okay. Here is the theorem. And now based on this theorem, you can construct the following confidence intervals. So uh, let's say the one minus alpha confidence interval, the length is given by the following expression. So it's of order one over square root of n. And now what can you say about the optimality of these intervals? Well, let's say that you are in low dimensional regime. So n is bigger than p. If you use the least square and try to construct this sort of inner wall, you get the following expression for the length. Okay, and here you have sigma hat because it's invertible. Now here we use our estimator in the high dimensional case, and this is the length of the confidence interval. So you see that only sigma hat changed the sigma. So it looks like this is the right thing that we, we should expect. Okay, so let me summarize so far that we, I, I defined the high dimensionality problem, the regime, and the regularized estimator, the uncertainty assessment, and the importance of that for uh, parameter estimation, and also some sort of the view over the optimality of the length of the inner walls. And the R package for computing this sort of inner walls will be available soon. Yeah, sure. So you, you provide uncertainty with respect to an estimator that is not the one that I want to run. Right. Because it's not the last one. Right. So you're going to talk about that gap? Uh, so this, the estimator that you, you can choose is based on you. <laughs> so people usually use the last estimator because of the nice property of its sparsity. And it's very good for estimation or prediction because it kills lots of noises. But if you want to address the question of uncertainty assessment, this is not the right estimator. Actually, there are some results that show the false discovery rate of lasso is lower bounded by something, no matter how large is signal to know the issue that you have. And now this modified estimator that I define actually address the problem of uncertainty assessment. So one, I mean, you can, I mean, if, if you have some data and you want to apply this method, you use your regularized estimator, and then you get some, some estimator, let's say theta hat, and then you should try to modify it to remove the bias if you want to address the problem of uncertainty assessment. So it's a two stage. So, but if I'm not using the last estimator in the first place, then mm -hmm. why would I not just use ridge regression, for example? Ah, okay. So it depends on what's your structure. So here I was focusing on the sparsity structure. So Lasso was, was the well-known approach to go about this. But if you want to put some assumption on the energy or the norm of the parameter, then you would use the ridge regression. But the sort of structure that each estimator is promoting is different. Can you clarify what you mean that you're focusing on the sparsity structure when in the end you're getting these confidence intervals around non-sparse structure? So what do you mean when you're saying that it's good for prediction? I mean, in a lot of cases, it's been shown that ridge regression is, <coughs> in some cases, actually better than lasso. So, uh, so, so what is the sparsity that uh, so is driving? I mean, OK. so. Yeah, the question is that there is some confusion between 
if you are saying that we are uh, focused on the sparsity, then you are defining this estimator which is not sparse, and then why it's a reasonable approach to go. Okay. So let's say that you have some data set and there is some sort of a structure. Okay. It could be anything. It could be a rank, it could be a sparsity, it could be the energy, the L2 nor. And then you define some sort of regularized cost function based on this, the, the structure that you want to seek for. Now in some cases, it's very easy to address the uncertainty assessment. For instance, if you are using the reach regression, because you can exactly solve that and it gives you some close form. But for, let's say, less two, it's very hard because there is no explicit formula for that. And now, let's say that we are focusing on a sparsity structure. So it's more complex than just L2. So you run this less two estimator, it gives you some sparse vector theta hat, which is very good for estimation and prediction. But the point that I want to raise here is that the goal is uncertainty assessment. It's not estimation or prediction. You want to say how sure you are about, uh, about how sure, how, what can you say with what level of confidence about the true parameter theta zero? Okay, so you don't really care about the estimation. At the end, you want to say something about the true parameter theta zero. So you start with. structure to the theta in the right. first place. Right. I mean, okay. I guess yeah, the, the confusion. Yeah. So in that setting, lots of the intervals would contain zero? Uh, yeah, so for, for the zero parameters in the lasso, your confidence interval would contain the zero. But in some cases, for instance, the lasso estimator is out of the interval but because if, of the bias. If I used your estimator for, yeah. I don't know, a predictive purpose? Ah, it's a very good would, point. Would I be better than rich regression? Uh, rich regression or lasso? In, in a sparse setting, right? In, you would be worse than Lasso, I presume, but uh, yeah. but you might still be better than rich regression, right? I, if the data if I want to use it for prediction, I would not just take this modified estimator because, as, as I said, it's not sparse anymore. So if you just hit it with a new feature vector, you are accumulating lots of noise. So one possible idea is to take this modified estimator and then hard threshold that. So once you hard threshold, you are getting rid of all these noisy parameters. But for all the entries who, who, are, who have survived, you know the exact distribution. So you don't have the problem of noise accumulation, and you have the distribution. And so you can make reasonable predictions with reasonable variance. And I believe it works better than ridge regression, especially if you have the sparsity. Yes? There are other ways to estimate sort of the end result right. of the range matrix, and you talk about the optimality for that particular choice of n. Mm -hmm. What about other possibilities? I mean, what is it about this particular choice? So, I mean, the way that I presented, I think, is reasonable because you want to somehow remove the bias and also minimize the variance. And we find the metrics M through some optimization. But there are some other approaches, like trying to estimate the trying to estimate the precision metrics or the covariance sigma, and then take m to be sigma inverse your precision metric. So I will discuss some of them in the related work. But let me give further insight. So there are two questions to be addressed here. The first one is how general this method is, and the second is what can we do if we have a smaller sample size. So in order to address the first uh, problem quickly, I consider the regularized estimator in the general form. So you have a loss function and you have some regularization. It could be anything, a sparsity, a rank, anything. And for the loss function, I'm assuming that you can decompose it over the sample. For instance, it's like likelihood, and since the samples are IAD, you can decompose it over the sample. And now, following the same philosophy, if you want to construct the unbiased estimator, you should take theta hat and then go in the direction of the subgradient, okay? So it's very similar to the one step of Newton method. Now the question is, how should we find the matrix M? You find the matrix M following the same philosophy. So you solve this optimization problem. The only difference is that sigma hat is not the empirical covariance anymore. Sigma hat is the feature information, okay? So if you are in the linear case, Sigma hat would be just one over an x transpose x. But in general, if you, are, you have some nonlinear model, it depends on theta hats. Okay, so you, this would be your sigma hat, and then everything is the same as before. 
And the second question is, what can we do if we have a smaller sample size? So people who are familiar with high dimensional statistics know that for estimation or prediction, the number of samples that you want should be bigger than S log P. But here, for the method that I presented, N was, in the theorem, N was bigger than S square log P square. And now the question is, can we match these optimal sample size? So I will provide partial answer to this problem. So in, in the first work, we consider the Gaussian design. So X has Gaussian entries. And we prove that you can do hypothesis testing and achieve this sort of optimality if N is bigger than S log P over S. Okay? But here we are assuming that the design is Gaussian. And in the second work, we consider this sort of sub-Gaussian uh, uh, designs. And we share one factor S. So N should be bigger than S log P square. And then the sort of optimality that we have is the average k. So we are saying the average length of the confidence interval is optimal, instead of saying that each one is optimal. Or you can use this method for hypothesis testing, and then we prove that the average power of the test is optimal, instead of just each individual one is optimal. OK. And as I said, uh, many people, many great researchers are working on this problem now. And did works have different assumptions and different results. And I see the results somehow complementary. For instance, in the first one, uh, Locke, Corden, Taylor, and Tipsharanis, they consider this sort of statistical significance problem along the lasso path. So you start with a large value of lambda. No parameter is selected. And as you decrease lambda, new variables come into picture. And at each step, you want to see whether it's a significant variable or not. So you are changing lambda, regularization parameter. But in our work, it was fixed, for instance. And here, this is not typo. Tipshirani, one is father, and the other is son. And Zhang Zhang, again, is not typo. So two different persons. For instance, to address your question, Ali, is, is for instance, here, they try to find a matrix M to be a very good approximation for the precision matrix. And they require the sigma inverse, the precision, to be sparse. But we don't have such assumption here. And they prove optimality in terms of semi-parametric efficiency. You can also propose the problem from a hypothesis testing point of view and say that I want to test whether the single parameters of my regression problem are they zero or non-zero and assign p-value to that problem. OK. So what are the future directions? So yeah, sure. Are right rather than the individuals. I'm just wondering <coughs> practically if like the setup was that you want to maybe use this for decision making or something of the sort. It seems like you would lose that ability if all you know is that the average interval is. Yeah, but I think if you want, for instance, to do the prediction once you are hitting your vector with, with the feature vector, what you carry is some sort of the average length of the optimal because you are aggregating all these parameters. Yeah, I mean, I guess, but then yeah. your prediction turns into a whole different problem than how to yeah, set yeah, up definitely. your motivation. Definitely. It depends right? on what problem you want. Yeah. Okay. So, but these are the results somehow suggesting that you can use the same method with n bigger than s log p, but we cannot prove it. <laughs> okay. So, of course, uh, the first direction is to do uncertainty assessment for prediction, and as we are seeing, there are some subtle technical issues here. <laughs> And the other is to see what are the other applications of this, on, of this sort of uncertainty assessment. So one application that I'm very interested in is in biomedical imaging. So you've probably heard of rapid MRI, where you can use the compressed sensing techniques to speed up the acquisition time. And it's very important because in MRI, if you want to take high resolution images, the patient should be perfectly still. Now one way is to deepen the anesthesia level to stop respiration. But in case of infants, it could be problematic. And the idea is that you can use this sort of compressed sensing techniques to speed up this sort of the, the scanning time. And the main idea is that most of the MRI images are sparse in some domain. For instance, the brain image is sparse in wavelet domain. So this is the pixel domain, this is the wavelet domain. And you want to exploit this structure to take the data in an already compressed form and then reconstruct the image from under sample measurements. So here is the measurement model. Theta zero is the true image. 
you are undersampling that. So you are taking only a few uh, Fourier coefficients of the image. And of course, you have noise. So this is your measurements. It looks like this one. And you are in the high dimensional regime because theta zero, the image is like the true parameter that I was talking about. And you are in high dimensional because the number of measurements is much smaller than the number of pixels. Now let's say that you do these compress sensing techniques, the lasso estimator, and you reconstruct some image like this. Okay. Now this reconstructed image is subject to all sources of variability because of the noise in your data acquisition, your inference reconstruction algorithm. And let's say that you see in your reconstructed image a barely visible mass. And you want to see whether it's a tumor or it's noise. Is the higher intensity here a tumor? Is it a serious problem or it's just noise? And how confident you are about this? So you see that it's intimately related to the uncertain assessment. It's exactly what I was doing for these parameters. Okay? So this is one area, especially in fMRI that images are much noisier, this would be very important. So I had a very good opportunity to work with many great researchers, and it helped me a lot to broaden my interest. So I was working with learning latent Bayesian networks with people at MSR, and compress sensing with David and Andrea, and reinforcement learning, and graphical model, robust belief propagation, and manifold learning and positioning, and multi-track map matching, and truncated estimator. So I will go quickly over these first two to just give a gist of idea of what are the problems. In my talk, I was speaking about this sort of high dimensional problem over parameterized regime. And one way to contain, include these sort of parameters in your model is, is through some latent factor. And in many tests, you want to use uh, your measurements and try to discover the latent factors that give rise to these measurements that you have. For instance, in social network, you want to see what are the interests or intents that shape the friendships in your network. These are latent factors that you, are, you don't know. Or in the new area of deep learning, for instance, you have a massive multi-layer neural net, and there are a large number of parameters, and you want to fit these parameters. And use these networks to uh, do feature extraction automatically from unlabeled data. Okay, so what's the result? So the result is that, okay, let me explain the model. So we assume some latent network. There is no assumption on the distribution or correlation among the latent factors. But we assume that there is some linear dependence between the observed nodes and the latent nodes. So x, the observed node, is given by a h plus noise. And a corresponds to this part of the graph. Okay. Now we prove that if you have some expansion property over this part of the graph, you can actually recover A, the parameters and the structure, only using the second order moments of the observed node. So you don't need the joint distribution. And further, if you know that there is some linear dependence between the hidden topics, so it's very like the linear structural equation, then you can recover the matrices A and B, which means exactly the, the whole graph, all the parameters and the structure, using the second and third order moments of the observed value. Okay, and the idea is to use some sort of tensor decomposition and spectral analysis from dictionary layer. So the second problem is compress sensing. So let me give it in one slide what's the contribution. And I will start by an example. So let's say that you have the following probability distribution. It's a mixture of some delta function and a uniform distribution, okay? And you have a signal x whose coordinates are coming IAD from this distribution. Now in compress sensing, what people do is that they try to reconstruct the, image, the, the signal from undersampled measurement. So let's say you have a matrix A, and in most of the cases, the classic one is to choose A to be a Gaussian matrix, the coordinate zero, one. You hit the vector X with, with the matrix A, so this gives you the measurements. And A is a fat matrix, so the number of measurements is smaller than the number of dimensions. And then you want to reconstruct X from undersampled measurement. Now, if you open any book or paper on compress sensing, there is some citation to a Donahoe-Turner bound, which gives you some fundamental limit for compression. 
So on the y-axis, you have the compression rate, the number of measurements divided by the number of unknowns. And on the x-axis, you have a sparsity, the fraction of non-zero entry. And then it's saying that if you are in this region above this curve, you can do the exact reconstruction. So if you have more non-zero parameters, you need more measurements. Now, if you look at this example, we have a mass 0.2 at zero. So 20% of the entries are zero. 80% are non-zero. So you are here in, in this curve. And the number of measurements that you need is 0.97 times n. So this is your compression rate. It's somehow disappointing because there are thousands of paper on compressed sensing. And if you apply this L1 reconstruction for this example, you only get 3% compression. So the question is, can we improve this or not? So in our paper, we have a different sensing mechanism and reconstruction that if you apply it to this problem, you can actually reconstruct the signal exactly from 0.2 times n number of measurements. So we, re we reduce the compression rate from 0.97 to 0.2. And I'm not saying any details, but you can guess that this 0.2 here is the coefficient of, of this continuous part. Okay, so this is the relation. And with this, I would finish my talk. We have a few more moments for questions. Peter? Yeah, sure. Your loss function here could be anything. And the assumption is that it can be decomposed over the sample. So let's say you have a nonlinear model. Your loss is just the log likelihood. OK, and then you follow the same approach. You take the theta hat, the regular decimator, and then move in the direction of the subgradient. Now, if you write the KKT, the subgradient of the regularization becomes exactly the gradient of the loss. But I have the problem that you could be in a local optima of the last function. Uh, so you are saying that if it's not convex? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I'm here inherently assuming that it's a convex optimization. Yeah. For, for different choices of regularization, it becomes. I mean, the last function is not problematic, but regularization is for some peculiar choice of regularization, it becomes non convex. Well, the, the last function could be non convex. Yeah, but uh, the point that, I mean, this is definitely a valid point, but then your estimation problem would be even hard, not just the hypothesis. That thing. So definitely I, I need all the assumptions that people need for estimation. Uh, and we'll thank Adele one yeah. more time. Thank you.